Welcome. Uh, today we are talking about um, the urban crisis. So I'm not going to do the full scale slideshow because I need to still have uh, the meeting controls. As I said, today we are doing the, the urban crisis. We're going to talk about um, how cities uh, in America, particularly the Northeast and kind of Midwest, uh, grew uh, over the course of the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, and then kind of shrunk and deteriorated, uh, leading to what, you know, scholars and, and a lot of folks called the urban crisis. Um, we're going to talk about the public sector uh, policies and private sector influences on cities that kind of led to, uh, you know, this kind of notion that cities are, are, are poor places. Uh, we're going to talk about what's been done to remedy that problem. And we're going to talk about uh, what's going on today and try to think about the future. Okay, so I wanna talk first about the formation of cities. Um, if you've studied American history at all, you're probably familiar with at least some of this. Um, and uh, I, I really like this session because this is the thing that I spent, uh, you know, three years researching uh, for my doctoral dissertation. So I'm gonna talk about it specifically in the Wilmington context. Um, so, Cities in America, you know, they existed before the Industrial Revolution, um, but they didn't really grow that rapidly or to be all that big until the Industrial Revolution. So um, the Industrial Revolution in America starting in the, the late, uh, am I recording? Yeah, we're recording. Starting in the uh, late um, 19th century. So 1880s, 90s, 1910, 20. Um, this is when we started having machines, right? We started having electricity. We started having uh, uh, mechanized uh, production. So factories were driven by like steam power and there were, um, there were uh, uh, machines that could replace a lot of labor or make laborers more efficient and effective. Um, we also started having mechanized transportation. So we're talking about trains, right? Uh, uh, rail lines uh, really kind of advanced uh, the growth of this country um, and, and also made it very easy for uh, uh, production and materials to be distributed around the country. So I want to show you, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Um, behind me, you're looking at Wilmington. This is, this is uh, Wilmington really before it was settled. Um, so it was really just the, the Delaware River out here to the east, um, and then the, uh, um, the Christina River to the south, right, and the Brandywine Creek to the north. Um, now, this is a really uh, interesting geographic feature, um, and it's also really important for uh, production. And let me, sh let me show you a little bit about why. So up north and out further to the west, there's a lot of uh, farmland. Right, so there's, uh, there's, there are people growing wheat uh, and, and other types of crops. Um, now, what's interesting here is the Brandywine to the north is narrow and it moves really, really fast. So um, if you are trying to power mills to grind wheat into flour, right, this is a great river for you because it'll drive those water wheels that'll, that'll grind that flour. Um, now, it's also interesting, the Christina to the south is very flat, very calm, and very navigable. So you can drive boats right up and down this river. Um, and then of course they, they empty into the, the Delaware. Um, the Delaware empties into the Atlantic Ocean. But if you go up the Delaware a little ways, you get to Philadelphia. If you go south, you're out in the Atlantic. Um, so it's a, really, it's a really important part of uh, manufacturing and shipping, right? Because you can basically, uh, get flour or get grain to Wilmington, grind it up, right, using this river, use this river to ship it out to the Atlantic and then anywhere else in the world, right? So, so that's Wilmington at the kind of around the uh, 16, 17, early 1700s. Um, you know, it started to populate because of this, right, because of commerce and because of trade. Um, so you start seeing uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, some factory stuff kind of in this area um, and some shipping. Um, but really that's kind of how it was until, uh, until about the Industrial Revolution. 
Okay, so you may have heard the, the phrase Rust Belt. Um, this refers to a lot of these cities that grew up as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and they're this red spot on this map here. So you've got New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, uh, Ohio over here, uh, Indiana, Michigan. This is the Rust Belt. This is, this is where all kind of a lot of heavy manufacturing was concentrated. Um, and they used a lot of steel and, and, and things like that, which rusts, so you get the rust belt, right? It's a clever name. Um, but as a result of the, uh, the one, the Industrial Revolution uh, and other things, uh, cities start to grow very rapidly in population around the turn of the century. Um, <clears throat> and that's what this map down here, or this, this graph down here is showing us. Um, you know, if, if you look at 1790 through about 1870, um, you know, the population of, of the country is mostly rural, right? It's about 90% rural. Um, and then we start getting into the, the latter part of the 19th century, the 1800s, um, we start to see it really start to climb. And then by, by 1990, uh, about it looks like about 80% of the US population is urban, but it really, really starts to turn and grow here around the Industrial Revolution. Um, so people start moving to cities for a bunch of reasons, right? We've got uh, economic opportunities. Um, up until then, if you lived in the US, you probably were born in a self-sustaining community. You probably were born on or near a farm and you probably worked on or near the farm. Um, that was about the way it was, right? Many families lived uh, together on, you know, in the same place um, and, and kind of generationally, you know, you had many, many relatives living in the same house. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, now all of a sudden you can go to a city and you can make money, right? And that becomes really a driving factor of population growth in cities. Um, we also have the Great Migration from, uh, from the South to the North, um, you know, after, uh, after uh, the abolition of slavery, um, some folks did still say in the South, um, there was the protection of the, the National Guard, or the, the, the army, um, you know, and there was a lot of kind of focus on safety and, and, and things like that during Reconstruction. And then 1877, uh, there's a pretty contested election um, <clears throat> resulting in a compromise, the Hayes-Tilden Compromise. Basically, um, it was negotiated that uh, Rutherford B. Hayes would become the president in exchange for removing troops from the South. So 1877, uh, the Hayes-Tilden Compromise um, means there's no more protection, right? So if you are Black and in the South, it's, it's, it's very dangerous for you, right? So uh, folks start, that's one of the reasons for the Great Migration North. Um, another one is uh, factories who were in need of labor um, sent scouts south and said, hey, we've got jobs. Come north. We've got jobs, right? We've got jobs for you. Um, and so, uh, you know, Wilmington and other industrial cities in, in the Rust Belt start populating. Um, <clears throat> and they, they boom, right? Like I showed you here. Let me show you what that looks like in, in Wilmington for a minute. Okay. so. Um, I mentioned we've got some mills and stuff and we've got some shipping. Well, now we've got pretty heavy manufacturing. Sorry, we've got pretty heavy manufacturing along the river, right? This is, uh, um, if you're familiar with Wilmington today, you know that there's like a baseball field here and there's a riverfront, right? A kind of tourist destination. But back in like the early 1900s, this was all super heavy industrial kind of factory space. Um, if you worked in these factories, you had to be, um, sorry, this is, yeah, all, all heavy industry, right? Um, all along the river because you want to be able to put your stuff onto boats. Um, there were also rail lines, right, for, for shipping stuff, right? So we see rail lines start to, um, So those are train tracks. 
Uh, so now we start seeing heavy industry along the, the Christina River. We start seeing rail lines for shipping goods. Um, but if you work in a factory and it's the turn of the century, you don't really have many options for getting around. So you're going to walk, which means you're going to live fairly close to where you work. So we start seeing Wilmington pop, uh, populating in this area, right? So like kind of near the water, uh, kind of near the industrial sites, uh, more population, um, you know, as it fills in. Um, this is somewhat industrial, but it's pretty marshy here. Uh, same thing down in this area is pretty marshy. Um, but eventually uh, they decide to build a port, right? The port of Wilmington uh, is built kind of right here. Um, and so this is a, a, another kind of major kind of shipping place, right? That's what ports are. Okay, so now we're starting to see Wilmington start to grow and develop. Uh, we've got industry, right? We've got factories, we've got rail, and we've got worker housing. Um, and this is what Wilmington looks like basically at the turn of the century. Urban economies were not very fair. Uh, they were production economies. Uh, so, you know, most folks worked in factories um, and where they, you know, the factories grew very quickly, there was a shortage of labor, right? So if you wanted to make some money, you could go work in a factory and get paid pretty well. As a result of the great migration and uh, kind of population rushing into cities, um, all of a sudden there's excess labor, right? And if we talk about economics, what happens to the price of something when there's a, an excess of it? It drops, right? If there's a lot of something and you're trying to move it, uh, you, you, it becomes cheaper. So basically factories could say, hey, you know, we're paying a dollar a day. And, you know, if you want a job, that's what you're going to accept. If you don't want to work for a dollar a day, well, you know what, there's, there's 20 other guys here who do want to work. So we'll take one of them. Um, and so, you know, pay was bad. Working conditions were, were this was pre-OSHA, right? So working conditions were very poor, very dangerous, unsanitary. And I've talked to you about The Jungle, the book by Upton Sinclair, uh, which kind of follows the Chicago meatpacking industry and uh, kind of the labor practices. Um, and, you know, while he did highlight those labor practices and, and kind of get some changes there, uh, also highlighted a lot of like the gross things that happened in the meatpacking industry and led to the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. Um, we also have at this time the rise of Taylorism. Uh, so uh, Frederick Taylor um, is a, um, he's like a scientist, you know, they were all kind of philosophers at one point, but basically his thing was to track people's movements Right. Uh, I, don't, this is, I, I don't think this is how you work in a factory, but uh, if it were right, he'd, he'd watch the movements that you make as you are, are making stuff. Right. And so he'd say, oh, well, if you move your hand, you know, only an inch this way, you're saving time and energy and you can be more productive. Right. If you like pick up your hand to reach and grab the next piece, you're, you're wasting time. So like just move your hand this way. Right. He would be very prescriptive about the way that you move when doing labor, because by uh, wasting movements, right, like, like this, right, um, now you're wasting energy, you're wasting time, and you're wasting money. So um, factories and an industry and employers really saw their laborers kind of more as equipment, right? You're, you're, not, you're not a person, you're a machine to do a job. And so, uh, you know, it wasn't a great place or time to be a laborer. As we get into the 1920s, right, the Roaring Twenties, there was there was some pretty widespread uh, uh, um, economic advancement. Uh, it was a pretty uh, pretty flush time economically. There were a lot of people who were doing pretty well. Um, in the in 1929, the stock market collapses, and we have the Great Depression start. Um, so most people in the country during the Great Depression um, didn't have a lot of purchasing power. Right. So uh, uh, credit dried up. Um, people didn't have much savings. Uh, this was before a lot of financial protections. So if you owned property like banks could like call in your loan, which means, hey, you've got to pay us everything that we lent you right now. Or we take whatever your your um, your your land, your farm, your house, whatever. We're going to take it. Um, you know, they could do that sort of thing. So a lot of people are left now in poverty. So are you, you're not purchasing stuff. 
Um, and then uh, late in the 1930s, the New Deal starts kind of picking up, right? And there's a little bit more prosperity. Um, but then there's World War II. Um, and World War II kind of money, right? Because people are, are, are starting to make money. Uh, war is profitable, right? So the, the, the manufacture of war goods, right, generates, generates money. Um, so you've got people making stuff, you've got uh, a lot of men fighting overseas, a lot of women stepping up and, and kind of filling those production roles and, and working um, because, you know, <clears throat> if there's no one to work in factories, you need someone, right? You need someone to make the stuff. Uh, so a lot of women stepped, in, stepped up into those roles. So you get like Rosie the Riveter and her, her uh, incredible biceps, right? Um, and uh, so, so now there's, there's money going around, but there's no stuff because all of the stuff is going overseas to, to fight the war, right? So uh, metals, a lot of metals were, uh, you know, being shipped overseas. So you couldn't get a lot of stuff that was made in metal. Uh, you know, uh, food, right? Meat, vegetables, uh, things like that were rationed because a lot of it had to go overseas, right? To fight the war. Um, and so there was money, but there was no stuff to buy with it. So then all of a sudden, World War II ends in 1945, and you've got two decades almost of, of pent-up demand. Demand, you know, us wanting stuff, right? In the 1930s, we couldn't buy anything because we didn't have any money. And then in the early 1940s, we got all the money, but there's no stuff, right? So all of a sudden, World War II is over, and all of, like, 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 like you ever kink a hose, uh, like a, a garden hose, Um you know, and you stop the water and then your little brother is like, oh, look at it. And then you open it up, right? And it shoots from the face. Um, it's kind of like that, right? The, the, the U.S. economy was like unkinking that hose. And so all of that pent up demand now is, is going, right? We've, there's money, there's stuff. And, uh, you know, all of this, this demand is released. Um, and so I've got some pictures here. This is a uh, uh, victory, I think this is the, the VJ day, victory over Japan day in, in Times Square. Um, and then of course, to the right here uh, is a picture of a demon child looking at some bread. Um, I don't know what ad executive uh, approved that ad, but um, yeah, wow. Uh, so anyway, they're advertising cellophane. So I wanted to pause here for a second. All right, so one of the things that I didn't tell you is that in 1902, uh, the DuPont Powder Company moves its headquarters to Wilmington. Um, so DuPont, uh, and I've mentioned this to you before too, DuPont quickly, very rapidly after 1902, uh, consolidates basically all of uh, gunpowder manufacturing into their company. Um, so they buy up all the gunpowder companies in the country. They become basically like the only game in, pow in town if you want stuff that explodes. Uh, so World War I starts uh, in about 1914, um, and hey, the only gunpowder manufacturer in the world, right, is, is making money, right, hand over fist, because they all want to blow stuff up, right, they need your gunpowder. So now DuPont, right, war is profitable, right, DuPont is making all of that money on, on the First World War, the U.S. gets involved in 1917. Uh, also important to note, DuPont sold powder to both sides of the uh, World War I until the U.S. gets involved. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the U.S. hadn't chosen a side for most of the war, so it didn't really matter. But once we did get involved, um, you know, they, they had to stop selling to the, uh, the, the Germans. Um, so what this means is, is DuPont sets their headquarters here in Wilmington, and DuPont has now money coming out of their ears. So uh, they start building lots of stuff, right? So uh, this is like, this is North Market Street up here. Um, so DuPont starts building uh, their headquarter building, right? Um, they build a hotel very close by, right? So they build a DuPont hotel. Um, they decided city hall doesn't look too good, so they build they build a city hall. Um, they bought they build a library, right? So now we've got Rodney Square, right? The, the nice the nice uh, nice pretty open space up here. You've got Rodney Square, um, and so there's a lot of money going into Wilmington's downtown to build kind of big, tall, elaborate buildings because they want to show off to executives of other companies. All right. Um, 
this is also, you know, turn of the century, a little bit later, 1920s, uh, we start getting street cars. Now, if you don't, if you don't have a car, right, most people don't have a car at this point, um, you know, you would ride a street car. What the benefit to this is now, if you've got a little bit of money to pay fares, you don't have to live right close to where you work in the worker housing. Now you've got some money, you can afford to travel a little bit. So we start getting streetcar lines that are going kind of a little bit farther out, right? We've got one that goes, uh, that goes kind of uh, north this way. We've got one that goes out this way. Sorry, I realize I'm talking away from you. Um, but now you've got streetcar lines right, running kind of out away from the center hub of the city. Um, so now if you've got some money, you can afford to live, right, a little bit further away. You can afford to live a little bit further away um, and, and some, of your, some of your nicer housing. Um, <clears throat> so you've got your kind of company executives and kind of office workers living a little bit further out on the streetcar lines and you've got your kind of manufacturing laborers living within walking distance of those factories. We've got some newfound prosperity um, as a result of this kind of uh, uh, end of World War II, um, you know, kind of generous funding of the New Deal and, and things like that. Uh, so more and more people want to buy houses. That's cool, right? Buying houses is good. Um, and I talked a little bit, I think, in a previous session about uh, the rise of universities uh, after World War II as a place to basically catch people coming back from the war. Uh, we had about five or six years of 18-year-old uh, men uh, basically leaving the country, right? Leaving the workforce um, and a lot of women stepping into those roles. Um, and then all of a sudden, the war is over. So you've got a whole generation of, of men, right, basically, uh, coming back from overseas, and you've got hundreds of thousands of them. And if you try to introduce them all to the economy at the same time, you're going to have problems, right? You're going to have surplus labor. Um, there's not going to be anywhere for them to go. There's not going to be anything for them to do. So uh, we start seeing kind of generous college funding. Right? We build up colleges and we say, hey, go here for four years, right? educate yourself, but it also slows, slows the, the entry right back into the labor force um, and you know, the GI Bill. But also, you know, we, 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 people want to own homes, right? So the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, and the Veterans Administration start making mortgages right? and, and backing mortgages for returning vets. Cool, right? They, you go fight. You did deserve something, right? Um, <clears throat> and even civilians, right, had access to new kind of new kinds of credit, new opportunities to buy housing. Uh, purchasing on the is on the rise generally. The economy is doing really well. Um, you know, you start seeing more houses like this one here on the bottom that are kind of like a little bit more space, kind of, uh, this is a um, split level, right? Split level houses kind of came into the fashion in like the 1950s. Okay. So, you know, you've got money, you're moving away from the center of the city, right? So you're moving into kind of suburban land, um, which is where a lot of those houses were built, right? They weren't built right in the city um, because the city is kind of dense, right? There's already stuff built there. Um, so, you know, people are, are starting to move out. Now you've got more roads, more people own cars. Uh, we've got things like that. Uh, President Eisenhower signs the uh, the... National Defense uh, Highway Highway Act, National Highway Defense Act, basically building interstate highways around the country. Um, he sees the Autobahn in Germ Germany, which had been uh, been there during the war, and said, "Hey, we need something like that, right?" And his whole thing was, if we build highways and we're ever attacked, we'll be able to move army stuff and war goods and machines and things like that to wherever we need to get them very quickly. Right, there hadn't been large highways before this. They'd been kind of like uh, 13, right? Uh, 13 here in Dover um, had been the largest kind of road in the state. Besides, we need bigger, bigger highways, faster moving highways um, for defense purposes. And and very quickly they got they 
you know, civilians can use them too, and they start being used for uh, for us driving around. Um, so by this point, you know, we've kind of got the the money is established, right? There there are, are kind of uh, wealthier neighborhoods further out, right? And we've got some. And we've got some more kind of industrial neighborhoods, uh, kind of closer to industry. Makes sense. When it was time to decide where to build the highway in Wilmington, uh, there were a few factors involved. Um, it seemed like uh, what the first plan that was introduced was to actually just follow the existing rail line through Wilmington, right? As opposed to building anything new, they're like, hey, there's a rail line there. We wouldn't be disrupting too much. We're just going to build it where the rail line is. And the wealthy people over on the west side of the city said, hold on a second. No, no, no. You can't do that. Because if you do that, it's going to take me even longer to get to the highway. I don't want to have to drive a long time to get onto the highway. They were also afraid that if you build it all the way over here, at some point, you're going to want to build another one in our neighborhood. right? Um, so they said, no, no, no. And uh, they fought it and fought it and fought it. And eventually, after several, uh, several years of court battles, it was decided we're going to actually build it right through the middle of the city. Um, so there was, there was housing here, right? There were whole neighborhoods all through here. They were uh, working class neighborhoods um, in Wilmington. At that time, these neighborhoods were pri primarily Polish, Italian, and Irish immigrants. Um, you know, working class population didn't have a lot of like social capital, didn't have a lot of, of money, um, but they're, you know, they owned their homes. Um, <clears throat> also in the, the 1950s, we start seeing uh, start seeing a lot of attention being paid by scholars and, and kind of uh, city planners to the built environment. Um, and so uh, all of this housing, this worker housing that I'm telling you about was built around the turn of the century, uh, predates things like indoor plumbing and kind of modern, you know, what we were then modern conveniences. Um, and they were old and they were fairly cheap. Uh, they weren't very big, um, but they were adequate. So uh, the east side, the east side over here uh, was a pretty economically stable black enclave, right? There were a lot of, uh, this is a pretty stable African-American community. There were uh, black owned businesses here. We're talking about the 1950s. Black owned businesses, um, doctors, lawyers, uh, it was a very tight knit community, uh, very cohesive. Um, and planning officials said, hold on, the built environment is terrible there you'd all be better off if we just knock down all your homes and build up nice new ones, right? And so when we knock them down, we're gonna build nice new ones, you'll be able to come back. So after quite some time of court battles and, and all of this stuff, they eminent domain, right? Used eminent domain powers to uh, relocate a lot of folks from the east side, right? Um, raised it all, right? knocked it all down and didn't build anything for 20 years. Um, <clears throat> so dispersed this, this neighborhood, this, this stable, uh, cohesive, economically vibrant neighborhood, dispersed, right? All that social capital is, is gone. Um, in its place, right, in, 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 you know, as a concession, they said, okay, well, we'll build some public housing, right? So they built public housing here. Uh, they built public housing uh, in what is now Southbridge. Uh, this is all very kind of marshy, swampy, uh, not super suitable for building stuff if you wanted to last. Um, they did it very cheaply. Um, and so, you know, you, we've got some of that. Uh, they also built some here, right, where it was disrupted by the highway, right? We had to knock some stuff down to build the highway. We'll build some public housing right near that, right? Basically under 95. Um, and they also decided, hey, we need some new government buildings. So they start building uh, government, government buildings here uh, near what they knocked down on the east side. 
eventually they built some more housing projects on the east side, but it, it just never came back the way that it was. So in the middle of the 20th century, we see Wilmington has evolved a lot, right? Uh, we, we've knocked down large portions of the built environment. We've moved people out of their homes for really no good reason. Um, we built a massive highway that, if you know Wilmington at all, basically cleaves the city in half, right? It, it's like you don't really cross the highway on foot too often. Now, it's not on street level, but it's still this, this weird like barrier, right, between the two, the two halves of the city. Um, <clears throat> eventually, later on, I'm talking like 20 or 30 years later, they, they built a highway here that's 495 so event you know eventually they did bypass the city um but you know this is this is now wilmington that's more or less what it looks like today all right so we've got all this newfound prosperity right lots of people have lots of money there's pretty generous funding for uh for uh college there's pretty generous funding for housing uh so if you've already looked ahead, you know what's coming. So what's the problem, right? Why, why is this the urban crisis? What's wrong with this? this? This money, all of this generous funding was available to a specific population and not available to others. Um, you know, these opportunities to purchase housing or take advantage of college funding were not equitably distributed. Um, if you were a person of color, you were not, you were excluded. Uh, you were excluded from these types of things. This, this stat jumps out at me. Um, so by October, 1946, right, as people are coming back from the war, the FHA is making these, uh, FHA and the GI Bill are making these, these, these loans, right, for houses to make mortgages across New York and Northern New Jersey. By 1946, the FHA issued 67,000 GI Bill mortgages, 67,000 mortgages, and 100, not 100, you know, just 100 of those 67,000 were issued to non-white veterans. 100 of those 67,000. Okay. Um, but there's more to it. Uh, so has anyone seen one of these maps on the right here before? Uh, this is a redlining map. So um, the FHA, uh, the Federal Housing Administration, the Federal Housing Administration wouldn't, um, they don't actually make mortgages, but they insure mortgages. So banks, uh, and I think I explained during when I was talking about the, um, the financial crisis of 2007. So banks loan out money, right? But they want it's a big risk, right? Because that money goes away. Um, so the FHA says, you know what? We're going to insure your mortgages. So you go ahead and make the mortgages. And if they default, we'll pick it up, right? We, the federal government, will pick it up. Um, but the FHA also said, we're not, we're not going to put ourselves at too much risk. So we are only going to insure mortgages in stable, stable neighborhoods. Um, how do you decide if a neighborhood is stable? In the 1940s and 50s, uh, you look at the racial demographics of that neighborhood. Um, and so this is a map of Philadelphia and the, the, uh, the colors here kind of uh, indicate what's stable and what's not so stable. Uh, the, the primary indicator for what is stable and not stable on these FHA maps is race. And so the, the, blue, uh, the blue is a good kind of stable neighborhood. This is a good investment. We'll make mortgages here. We'll back mortgages here. Uh, the red is like, no way. This is not, this is not a good investment. We're not going to back mortgages here. So they look at race. They say, well, there are a lot of white people living in the blue areas, right? So they must be good, right? And there are a lot of uh, people of color, black people, uh, Latinx people living in the, the yellow and red areas. They're not good investments. So we've got the federal government, right? The Federal Housing Administration, our federal government that represents us, right? 
uh, is is willfully and not not very thinly veiled at all, right? Making racially discriminatory mortgage practices. So why is this important? This is important for a number of reasons. Um, one, uh, if you uh, are super bored and you've got a lot of time, uh, I would encourage you to pick up this book, Capital in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty. He is a French economist um, who basically looks at capital in the, like basically the distribution of wealth over the course of the 20th century and historically, right before that too. Uh, but basically he finds that capital money accumulates faster than earnings. Uh, so what, what does this mean? That means if, if, if I have some wealth, I can make that wealth work for me by investing it, right? If I invest it, I get some returns, right? And they, they accumulate, right? My, my wealth gets bigger over time, the more I invest, right? If I don't have that, I have to rely on selling my labor, right? To accumulate any kind of money. And it's just, it's the case that wealth accumulates returns faster than labor. Uh, so you, you, you're never really building wealth. Uh, so basically people who start off with assets, right? Will become wealthier over the course of their lifetime than people who do not start out with assets. Um, in the U.S. context, housing is the most effective way for we as individuals to build our net worth, right? And I, I explained a little bit of this before. Um, <clears throat> I want to buy a house. I don't have the $200,000 sitting around to buy a house with, um, so I need to borrow it. And, you know, I, I can make my 20% down payment, whatever, um, but I, as I make my monthly mortgage payments, um, I now own more and more equity in that house. So after the 30 years of my mortgage, I own this house that's worth hopefully more than I paid for it because housing appreciates over time. Um, and that is now an asset, right? That, that's an asset that can be leveraged for investment. We know that education correlates with economic success later in life. Um, and we know that um, places with higher property values have more tax revenues to pay for schools, right? So, so school systems are funded largely through taxes uh, on property. And so wealthy areas, property is valued more. Those areas have more money to put into their school systems, right? Poor areas, property value is much lower. Tax revenues on those properties are lower not as much money to invest in schools. Through housing and other types of assets, uh, wealth is passed down through generations, right? It's very rarely the case that if my parents are wealthy, I am going to be poor, right? That's very, very, very rarely the case. Um, it's also very, very exceedingly rarely the case that if I'm born poor with no assets and my parents are very poor, that I am going to later become rich, right? This is like the, the uh, uh, I don't wanna call it like a myth, right? But this is something that like is a very pervasive belief about like America is that like you can, uh, you know, start off poor and end up a millionaire. It's happened. It happened a lot more kind of earlier in American history, but, <laughs> it, it's a it's a tall order. Uh, it's it's exceedingly rare. So when someone actually is a self made wealthy person, like good on them because that's a very very difficult thing, almost impossible thing to do. Um, <clears throat> it's also important to remember that success as an adult is much more likely under stable conditions in childhood. So success as an adult is more likely under stable conditions in childhood. If you've got uh, you know. Your, your, your family is, is solid. You don't have to worry about anything. If you, you know, you're not experiencing violence, if you're not experiencing hunger uh, or, or, you know, any of the conditions of poverty, you're, you're probably, you know, you're set up for more success as an adult, right? If you're experiencing all of those hardships as a child, 
they, they compound, right? And they make it harder for individuals to succeed later in life, right? So I'm asking you to remember all of these things because this is all gonna be put together now, right? Now we start getting into the urban crisis. Remember I showed you on my map behind me here that um, <clears throat> uh, people are moving farther and farther away from the city centers, right? Uh, and uh, if you are buying a house, right, you want to, you want the house you want, right? You want it to be, you want a little bit of space, right? You want some, some, some grass, you want some lawn, uh, you want a place for your, your kids and, or your, you know, your 2.2 kids and your dog to run around. Um, you want that white picket fence, you're not going to get it in the city, right? You, you need that space and it's going to be in the suburbs in places that aren't built. I, this image here on the right is a flyer for Levittown. Uh, so uh, Samuel Levitt was a housing developer in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, um, <clears throat> who basically got really good at essentially think of it as uh, uh, assembly lines for houses, right? So he would go and buy up like large empty plots of land in the middle of nowhere or kind of on the periphery of cities. Right, so uh, a lot of cornfields, right? Cornfields that kind of go under, um, aren't really farmable anymore. He'd buy up whole, whole farm, you know, whole, whole open farmland space and basically could build houses very quickly and very cheaply, right? And he had crews that would like, okay, I've got a, a foundation crew, right? And so they're gonna come and they're gonna dig the pit and they're gonna pour the foundation and then they move on to the next one. And right behind them is the framing crew and they're gonna put up the, you know, do the framing, build the house, um, and then they move on to the next one. And then right behind them are the electricians, right? And they do all the wires and behind them are the plumbers and they do all the plumbing and then the people who do the finish work and all of that stuff and the roofers and all, yeah. So um, <clears throat> by having these crews that can move from house to house to house to house, um, they can build houses very, very quickly and in, in rapid succession and a lot of them, right? So he built, these whole neighborhoods, these whole Levitt towns, right? Uh, pretty cheaply, right? To the point where, uh, what year is this? Um, he's advertising a whole house here in, in Levitt town uh, for $8,500. I don't know what one of these houses is worth today. You know, if, if you are uh, looking to buy a house, like this is a great deal for you. It's fairly cheap. It's not huge or elaborate, right? But it's, it's, in, it's in the suburbs, you've got some space, you've got some grass, you've got the white picket fence, you know, yay. Um, so cities begin depopulating. Now, because of the discriminatory lending practices of the FHA and bankers and all of this, um, the population that is leaving and buying houses is mostly white, mostly has some, some money. Not a ton, right? They're not, they're not super wealthy yet, um, but they have some money. Businesses, right? If I'm a business who sells lamps, right? I'm not gonna stay where people aren't gonna be able to buy my lamps, right? I'm, I'm going to follow the money to the suburbs, right? Um, <clears throat> so businesses follow that moneyed population out of the cities and into the suburbs. Um, as does investment in things like transit, bus lines, things like that, uh, and infrastructure, building nicer roads, right? Building uh, public, public utilities, right? Infrastructure investment. Um, so all of that attention, all of that money, all of that investment is now being made in the suburbs and not, not in the cities. Of course, if you don't invest, in the built environment, it will deteriorate over time, right? It's just it's how it works. Um, if you don't maintain your home, it will deteriorate. Just through the general use, stuff breaks, uh, carpets get dingy, right? It's just the built environment needs maintenance. Um, and so there's no maintenance going on, right? There's no maintenance going on in the, in the cities due to this lack of investment because businesses all followed the money out to the suburbs, there aren't many jobs available to inner city residents because transit followed the money to the suburbs. There aren't bus routes or 
trolley lines or things like that running to inner cities. Uh, you know, explicitly racist Jim Crow policies continue unofficially uh, through the 1960s. Um, there's a lot of, you know, even though we've got the civil rights movement uh, and, and, and kind of some progress being made, right? It's still on, on the ground, you know, very, very inequitable. I also want to point out, you know, there of course is poverty in rural parts of America too. Um, Lyndon Johnson was especially aware of this. Uh, so Lyndon Johnson grew up pretty poor uh, in Texas, um, you know, and kind of got, uh, he, he's one of those rare self-made people, right? He, he became a senator um, and eventually vice president and eventually president, but was, was very sensitive to poverty. <clears throat> so Lyndon Johnson is, is super aware of poverty and as soon as he can declares an unconditional war on poverty. Um, that was my bad 1960s uh, old person voice. Uh, so, you know, lots of investment in social programs. Um, and there are responses now to the urban crisis. So we've got Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program, uh, programs, and it was a whole presidential initiative and the war on poverty. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was, of course, about um, uh, racial inequities, uh, but also it was about economics. It was about the availability of, of economic opportunity. Um, and if you click on the, the link there, you'll see a video of, of Martin Luther King talking about um, the ways in which the wealthy have received subsidy, right? Um, that is not available to people of color. Through the 1960s and 1970s, you know, there are kind of massive investments in anti-poverty programs. So things like SNAP uh, and, and, well, what is now SNAP, uh, what is now WIC, uh, what is now TANF, right? There are all these investments in those kinds of programs to help lift people out of poverty. Um, and then, of course, there was also slum clearance and urban renewal. So, you know, just, just leveling slums, right? Leveling places that poor people live that have been kind of deteriorating over time. Yes, they were physically deteriorated, right? Um, it's, yes, it's wrong to, to forcefully move people, but yes, the built environment was also cruddy. When we talk about urban renewal, right? We're talking about these kind of ideas for how do we make the built environment more stable, more, uh, more conducive to human growth and development? So this, this French uh, architect, uh, his name is like Corbusier, um, which I think his first name being the, is pretty cool. Um, I hope someone calls me the Burke uh, at some point in my life. I hope I get to be that influential. Um, but he's got this idea for um, these, these towers, right? The tower in the courtyard. And it's this like utopian idea where in this tower, you've got apartments, people can live there, but in the towers, you've also got schools and doctors and businesses um, and everything that a person needs in their day-to-day -day life. So that the built environment isn't all spread out and it's not all this like concrete and everything, but there's green space between all the buildings. Um, so that, you know, he, this idea that we humans need to be outside and enjoying nature, right? And so by having everything in the tower, um, you know, we can have more nature around us because we're not building there, we're building everything's inside. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it's super convenient, it's super utopian, it's, it's going to be great. Um, so uh, does anyone have any idea, do these, do these towers look like anything to you? How about now? Okay, so now we're looking at housing projects in New York City. Taking Corbusier's idea of building the, the tower in the courtyard, right? We've got these towers with apartments uh, surrounded by green space. Great, right? A um, couple things, right? A couple caveats. They did not, I repeat, not follow up on schools and doctors and businesses being in the towers with the apartments. They did not do that. Um, I also want to point out that are these projects close to the downtown? 
I mean, you could see the downtown in the far distance, right? Um, so there's really just, it's just residential, right? There's nowhere for you to go to work, right? There's no, there's no businesses around you, aren't very many hospitals, doctors, uh, there aren't very many cultural attractions, right? It's just, it's just housing and it's pretty isolated, right? Uh, so how does this go? Um, so by the 1970s, uh, this guy in the middle here, um, you may recognize him. Uh, he's a lot older now. Um, that's, uh, that's Jimmy Carter, right? He's touring, uh, the Bronx. Um, he was on like this, like press tour of New York city or whatever and you know asked to kind of go to the bronx he wanted to see uh you know poverty and <laughs> the i think the mayor of new york at the time was pretty mad that like his his staff let carter go and see like the poor part of new york right he's like pretty mad about it um but you can see it's pretty deteriorated it's pretty bad right um <clears throat> so what we do know um, and I forgot to mention a couple slides ago, I'm gonna go back very, very briefly. So we've got uh, Dr. King up top and then down below this guy, like looking at him very happily, uh, actually was a big fan of, of, of him, uh, that's Bobby Kennedy. So John's brother, Bobby Kennedy was a Senator uh, and uh, Bobby Kennedy um, was actually pretty influential uh, in, helping make funding available for community-based development. So uh, he, he worked with a, a group to get uh, an organization going in Bed-Stuy to do community-planned, community-oriented, focused development. Uh, they did housing development, they did business development, they did pro professional human development type work. Um, and it went, it went really well until the Nixon administration when it was all cut. Uh, but what we did learn is that funding for self-determined projects seems to go better than government built housing projects. So when you invest capital in communities for their own planning and their own doing, you get better outcomes than when you just, we're doing this. Right. Here's the money. We're doing this. We're not giving you the money. We're just going to build a build a tower, and you you live in it. Right. Um. There's there's more to it, and we're getting very close to the end here. Um. <clears throat> so the built environment contributes to a lot of problems. Um. If especially if it's deteriorated. So we've got, um. You know, in in these uh these in Southbridge, right? Uh. There's a lot of moisture in the buildings. Um. Moisture in buildings tends to grow mold um, and mildew. Um, so where that happens, uh, you get a lot of kind of respiratory infections, respiratory illnesses. Um, in, in low lying areas, you are exposed to pollutants at a higher level, factories and, and things like that that put out uh, uh, you know, noxious chemicals and, and smells and, and things like that uh, tend to be near in proximity to poorer developments, right? So the built environment contributes to the problem, but is, is a symptom of larger issues, right? It's not just that the built environment is bad. It's that there are other societal issues, right? And I told you about all of them, or not all of them, but many of them, uh, you know, contributing to the deterioration of the built environment. Um, there's also a sociologist uh, named William Julius Wilson, who has made the case, uh, in the 1990s, basically saying that when you isolate anyone, right, any community from mainstream economic activity, right, like mainstream normal economic acti activity, um, eventually over successive generations, later generations are not going to be able to re-engage in that economic uh, opportunity, right, um, because if you isolate that community from jobs, right? There are no jobs for that community to do. Um, so they, there's no work, right? They don't go to work because there is no work, right? Um, eventually 
kids who grow up in those communities don't have the behaviors, right? They don't have the modeling of what it is to go to work, right? And to be a professional. Um, and so long-term isolation, right? Just intergenerational isolation from mainstream economic activity uh, inhibits, right? Anyone after successive generations from being able to re-engage because you don't have that behavioral base, right? Not only is there no wealth, but there's also no kind of way to integrate back into kind of mainstream jobs, right? So we talk about, well, just go get a job. Well, you know, what does that mean? How does that work, right? Um, there's also, and this is prevalent even today, uh, a lack of political will to invest in targeted interventions. So when we say, hey, we wanna launch this program that is going to make it, uh, that is going to provide funding, right? Money, right, to poor people, right? Not, a, not very popular, right, politically. You know, people don't want to invest in poor people. Um, universal programs, stuff we all get is much more popular, but much less, in, less effective. I also want to point out that uh, wages, uh, when you adjust for inflation, have not increased very much at all since the, the mid 1960s, right? So when you adjust for inflation, uh, wages have, lit, have been stagnant compared to the cost of living, right? Um, any growth in US wages have occurred at the top 90th percentile. So that the people making uh, more money than 90% of us have seen income growth but the rest of us, the 75th, the median, the 25th and the 10th have remained flat over time. There have also been some shifts in skills and economics, uh, the, the larger economy. Uh, you know that manufacturing has declined, right? In the United States, all of these, these industrial uh, factories and stuff that uh, are around the Wilmington, Wilmington Riverfront, right? They're not factories anymore. Manufacturing has gone overseas, right? As part of uh, redevelopment after World War II, <clears throat> there was like an active foreign policy uh, initiative to build uh, economically overseas, kind of help rebuild from the war. Um, but also automation, right? It's not so much overseas stuff anymore that that ship has sailed to use a terrible uh, pun. Uh, not really a pun, but you know what I mean, cliche. Um, but automation is now the thing that's displacing unskilled labor, right? Unskilled labor being stuff you can do without a lot of training or education, um, which then drives unskilled labor to the service industry, which is still pretty strong here in the U.S., right? Service industry, restaurants, fast food, uh, retail, uh, things like that. But those industries don't pay very well at all, right? They're very low-wage industries. They're also very vulnerable. Uh, as we saw during the 2007 recession, a lot of folks, well, even uh, during the, the COVID crisis, a lot of folks who work in the service industry got laid off during COVID, right? Because um, people aren't going out and spending money, so we can't afford to keep you, right? So, so unskilled labor, which used to be pretty secure in factories and manufacturing and things like that, is, is sent into this super vulnerable, super low wage service industry. Okay, so I'm asking you to, um, as you move forward, right, in, in, your, in your life, um, <clears throat> I want you to imagine the future, right, where we are today, right, and I've told you where a lot of where we've been, and I know I've talked a lot today, and I apologize, but I've told you kind of where we've come, right, I've shown you how Wilmington has grown, right, and I'm asking you to imagine where it's going, right, um, I'm not, just what, what does all of this mean when we start thinking about uh, the U.S. political system, uh, the economy, the, the communities that you're a part of, um, if we let it continue, where is it going? Um, and think about what, what can be done to change the trajectory. Um, I hope that, that you have the answers, right? And I hope you will be part of, of the solution. And I think I can start very, very small. And I swear I'm, I'm very, very nearly done. The way that I say it can start small, if you've ever seen a bench like this, right, in a public place, 
they usually have some little bump or something like that in the middle, right? Do we know what that bump is for? It makes it so that you can't lay down on one of those benches. Um, so, you know, if this is the way that we treat other human beings, right? There are little tiny things that we can change, right? So uh, going forward, I ask you to think about these things. Um, I don't have a lot of answers for you. Um, I mean, I, I teach classes on like what can be done, but um, you know, I, we're not gonna fix all of it, right? I, I can't give you the magic solution that's gonna fix all of it. So I hope that you will think about it. You will come up with those innovative ideas that are gonna advance humanity.